Hello this is KYC News. We provide you with the most up-to-date and reliable information for the day. First and foremost, we want to achieve perfect health with a sincere desire. Two Netflix actors were killed in a vehicle accident in Mexico. Two Netflix actors were killed in a vehicle accident in Mexico. After the vehicle they were riding in collided near Mullage on the Baja California Sur Peninsula, two actors from the Netflix series The Chosen One were killed and six other cast or crew members were injured. The accident happened on Thursday, according to local media, when the van flipped after veering off the road in a desert location. At the time, the crew was reportedly operating in the Santa Rosalia neighborhood. Raimundo Gardua Cruz and Juan Francisco Gonzalez Aguilar died on Friday, according to the Baja California Department of Culture. A 12-year-old child discovers he's the returned Jesus Christ, destined to save humanity, Netflix says of The Chosen One. Based on the Mark Miller and Peter Gross comic book series. The series is being taped by an independent production firm, according to casting calls. Iran and Russia have reached an agreement on a number of economic initiatives, the most important of which is the joint manufacturing of automobiles in Iran and cooperation in the construction of the Rosh Star Railway. Following the visit to Moscow on Friday of Iran's head of trade promotion organization al Reza Payment Pack, Russia's Deputy Prime Minister Alexei Overchuk expressed Russian President Vladimir Putin's support for the completion of the Rosh Star Railway construction project, as well as the country's serious determination to pursue Iran's BRICS membership. During the discussion, the Russian Deputy Prime Minister praised the North-South Corridor's reactivation and stated that Russia has expressed its willingness to complete the railway's construction in Iran. The two sides then discuss monetary issues, the formation of a combined production working group, the supply of industrial parts to Russian industries by Iranian factories, and the establishment of joint free zones in Iran's North and South, among other things. The head of the POI emphasized the importance of Russia playing a vital role in renovating Iran's rail transportation fleet, revamping the Caspian Sea shipping fleet, and repairing Iran's road fleet. In terms of collaborative automobile production between Iran and Russia, Payment Pack stated that talks have taken place with some Russian officials in the subject of joint venture production of a Russian-Iranian car in Iran. In turn, Russia's deputy prime minister referred to the imposition of sanctions against the country and underlined the importance of developing new monetary and banking exchange mechanisms between the two countries. Before their meeting in Senegal, Secretary Antony J. Blinken and Senegalese Foreign Minister Asad Atal Sal. All right, everyone, good morning. It's an honor to be able to welcome my colleague and friend, Senegal's Foreign Minister. Welcome to the State Department, Asada. I had a lovely visit in Senegal, where we spent a lot of time together. Since then, we've had numerous discussions. And our two countries are strong allies on a wide range of problems, thanks to a common set of principles. I'm looking forward to continue the discussions we started in Dakar last November, as well as the projects we've been working on since then, especially at the UN. I believe we'll discuss how to address the escalating food security situation, which has been compounded by Russia's actions against Ukraine. This is a critical issue for both of us, as well as many other countries across the world, and we've been working hard to figure out how to handle it in the short and long term. Senegal, of course, has been a pioneer in the fight to eliminate COVID-19's acute phase and, more broadly, to ensure global health security. That is something we will discuss. We're also partners in security cooperation, economic prosperity, combating climate change, and resolving regional concerns, to name a few. So, as always, there is a full schedule, but I'm very glad to be able to repay you for your incredibly warm hospitality as well as the extremely productive visit I had with you and President Macky Sall. Respectfully, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to express my delight as well as that of my delegation, at being invited to this working visit at the State Department by Secretary of State Mr. Blinken, who, as you know, was in Dakar last November to further strengthen this wonderful relationship of cooperation between the United States and Senegal. Ours is a long-standing collaboration. It is founded on our own and shared political, human, and moral values, democratic values, values of respect for human rights, fundamental values, freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of action, freedom to assemble, freedom to choose one's political orientation, and freedom to choose one's religion, all of which we respect in Senegal, as they are in the United States. This is already the foundation of our relationship's construction. 
And I was telling Secretary of State Mr. Blinken in Dakar last November that while all U.S. Secretaries of State have visited Dakar, his visit was historic because it was in a dual context. The first backdrop is that we had not yet overcome the pandemic, and he resolved to visit Senegal despite these limits. This is something that the government of Senegal, led by President Macky Sall, has really valued. The second background is that Senegal was the only French-speaking country to profit from Secretary of State Mr. Blinken's first official visit to Africa. This was a powerful message to us, one of friendship, but also one that indicated that we must work together to confront all of the difficulties that are shaking the world. He mentioned that to you. Ukraine is in the midst of a crisis. We'll discuss it once again. How can we work together even more effectively? Senegal was grateful for the United States help in the fight against COVID-19 as part of COVAX, as well as all of President Biden's current measures aimed at bringing the globe closer to democracy and combating COVID-19. And Senegal was present at these very summits, the Summit for Democracy Online, and all across the world. Senegal benefited from this cooperation and all of the United States economic activities on behalf of the entire world at all times. USAID has been in our nation for a long time, but before that, in 1963, the Peace Corps was already there, followed by AGOA, MCC, and now, today, DPW and then DFC, and so on and so forth. So this is the state of our economic cooperation, as well as our political commitments, and our relationship with the US government, since we share the same principles that I just described. That is why, dear Anthony, I am delighted to see you again this morning and to convene this working meeting in order to set a new landmark that will go down in history. I just signed the guest book, and I mentioned that this is going to be a long trip, but it will be episodic, with each player playing their part every now and then. And today, it's you representing the United States, and me, humbly, representing Senegal, and I'm confident that we'll write many more lovely pages to further develop our friendship. In the battle to become Colombia's president, a former communist guerrilla and a rich businessman will face off on Sunday, trying to become the country's new president after a front campaign in which no contender appeared safe. Gustavo Petro, 62, won the first round of voting easily last month and is aiming to become Colombia's first left-wing president. Colombia's traditional political elites, on the other hand, have thrown their support behind Rodolfo Hernandez, a 77-year-old construction entrepreneur. Recent opinion polls have been inconclusive, implying that the election will be close. Guerrilla Event Planner Petro, a self-described revolutionary warrior for the marginalized, black and indigenous peoples, the poor, and the youth, promises to end hunger and inequity. Petro is running for president for the third time after being accused of autocratic inclinations while serving as mayor of Bogota from 2012 to 2015. The father of six is said to be a good order, but not particularly charismatic. He enjoys maps and is active on social media. Petro, who was born into a poor family on Colombia's Caribbean coast, became interested in leftist politics as a teenager after Chile's Marxist president Salvador Allende was deposed in a coup in 1973. As a 17-year-old, he joined the N19 urban guerrilla group, but later claimed that his role in Colombia's decades-long civil war was as an organizer, not a combatant. Petro was apprehended by the military in 1985 and claimed to have been tortured before being imprisoned for almost two years on weapons accusations. In 1990, he was released, and the M19 signed a peace agreement with the government. Since then, he has served as a senator and a mayor. Petro's detractors have tried to paint him as a radical populist who will bring the economy of Venezuela to its knees. He has, however, denounced Colombia's neighbor's banana republic government and promised that no expropriation will occur under his watch. Petro goes in a convoy of a dozen armored cars, accompanied by police on motorbikes, an ambulance, and snipers, in a country where political assassinations are common. He has stated that he will reopen talks with Colombia's final rebel group, the ELN, in order to dismantle the drug trade peacefully. He has made it his duty to combat climate change, including controversially shutting out crude oil drilling, which is a major source of revenue for Colombia. Millionaire Maverick Independent candidate Hernandez, dubbed the Colombian Trump by some, surprised many by reaching the second round. With a succession of left-field policies and awkward gaffes, the rich maverick has already ripped up the typical election campaign playbook. Hernandez is anything but conventional, from promising to close embassies across the world to pay off student debt to making sports and going out on the open sea mandatory. 
he has managed his campaign almost entirely on social media, he refers to himself as the king of TikTok, and has demonstrated a propensity to make 180-degree policy shifts mid-campaign, such as initially supporting and then opposing fracking and the chemical spraying of narcotic crops. He ran on an anti-corruption platform, labeling traditional politicians thieves, only to gain their support after defeating their candidate Federico Gutierrez in the second round. I accept votes from wherever they come, but I don't want orders, he explained. Despite his anti-corruption stance, Hernandez is facing a graft probe related to the awarding of a 143 million US dollars garbage collection contract to a company linked to his son Luis Carlos during his stint as mayor of Bucaramanga in northern Colombia. On July 21, he will stand trial. During his term as mayor, from 2016 to 2019, he made his most serious error, declaring himself a follower of the great German thinker Adolf Hitler and live on the radio. He claimed, very unconvincingly, that he mistook the Nazi leader for Albert Einstein when prompted by the station hosts. He drinks. Out of dissatisfaction with the old political class, out of interacting in a plain, colloquial manner. And, of course, falls into the world of populism, says the author. Hernandez claims to be worth $100 million, having built his money in the 1970s through creating an expensive housing. He has pledged not to accept his salary and to cut political expenses, claiming that he wants to eliminate poverty without getting rid of the rich.